fair warning in advance, there's a lot of QR codes on these slides. So <laughs> be prepared. If there's anything of interest to you to follow up on, uh, try to grab a picture. Um, the slides are going to be available afterwards, and there's a recording, too, for all these sessions. So if there's um, something you want to go into in more depth, you know, you can always find it online. And uh, I'll give you my, my connection info for, um, for, for LinkedIn as well if you want to just follow up uh, with any particular questions. I'll be around here even through Member Summit on Thursday. So if you want to ping me in the CNCF Slack or find me on LinkedIn, uh, go ahead and do that as well. Okay, so um, we'll get started here. So this talks on how to make your first contribution to a CNCF open source project. And so for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to take a look at what the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, is. Uh, we'll look at ways you can make your first contribution. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do that. And I'll leave you with a few resources. So even once you've made that first contribution, ideally you can grow within the community um, and build out some skills that'll help you in the workplace or to uh, build your community and um, hopefully um, improve the state of the tech world through your open source contributions. So in my current role uh, at the CNCF, which I joined about a year ago, I focus on contributors, maintainers, other folks that are trying to uh, build their open source projects within the context of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So whatever project needs to thrive, it's my responsibility to, to make sure they're unblocked, that they're getting what they need. Um, before that, I was at IBM for 20 years, um, and I was an end user, as it were, uh, in the industry in partnership with the CNCF uh, as, as a cloud provider. And uh, within a larger Linux Foundation ecosystem, uh, I was also um, managing about 20 projects at a Tech for Good initiative that Linux Foundation does um, in partnership with the United Nations, unrelated to what was talked about earlier today at the keynote, but, but somewhat related, um, named Call for Code. And there's, there's some great resources that um, I put together for new contributors in that role um, that hopefully you'll, you'll find helpful here as well, some talks, some GitHub uh, workshops, things like that. All right, so let's, let's get into the CNCF. Um, so how many folks here are already familiar in some way with the CNCF or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation? All right, great. Um, are you, anybody a maintainer of a project right now? Okay, no maintainers? Good, well, hopefully we're matched up new contributors with maintainers, but I know there's a few around uh, the conference, so if you want to be introduced to anybody, for example, who maintains Helm or con uh, ContainerD, uh, or open telemetry, I can definitely uh, connect you as well. Um, is anybody here an ambassador in the CNCF community? Okay, and ambassadors are also folks that can help out. They're down at the CNCF booth, um, and they're around the world. Their, their goal is to, to help um, share knowledge about cloud native computing. Um, and then anybody here a Cubester not? Okay, this is great. I've got the right audience. But uh, be aware, there's a lot of help. There's a lot of people at this conference that, uh, that you can talk to, to to kind of speed you along on this path to your first contribution. Okay, so the CNCF, the, the main goal is really to host open source projects and make sure that we build a community around those projects to make sure they're successful. So the CNCF is a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation. Um, it can get a little confusing. Uh, the example I like to use is imagine the European Union is the Linux Foundation. Uh, within the European Union, in that case, the CNCF is Germany, France, and Italy combined. It's the largest thing within the Linux Foundation. And there's other sub-foundations, such as the Open SSF, uh, focused on security, to things like LF Edge for edge computing and LF networking, uh, just among a, a whole set of other states within this union. Uh, and our goal is really to make sure that best practices for software development, modern software development, are adopted and strengthened worldwide through these open source projects and the community of users. Um, and our history isn't just modern software. It's really building upon open source and existing technologies that have been around for 
20 and longer years. Um, so starting with bare metal hardware um, during the first dot-com boom, for example, if you remember, uh, a lot of startups were built on really proprietary Unix systems. Uh, and then as cloud and virtualization came about, cloud providers providing uh, that infrastructure as a service. Uh, and about 10 years ago, it really took off with a lot of innovation in the as a service area. So infrastructure as a service, platform as a service with Heroku and Cloud Foundry, uh, through to uh, infrastructure as a service with OpenStack and uh, Docker, uh, really brought about containers around 2013, so about 11 years ago. And uh, that quickly resulted in how do you orchestrate containers? And that's really the crux of where the CNCF came from. It was actually created as a way to host the donation from Google of Kubernetes, which is something they used in their infrastructure to uh, orchestrate containers at scale, going beyond bare metal and virtual machines uh, to the container as the unit of compute. And so beyond that, that start as a host for Kubernetes, um, the CNCF has now become the default ecosystem for lots of other types of workloads on top. So whether that's serverless through something like Knative, uh, whether that's Wasm, a new emerging compute framework that started with sandboxes in, in web browsers, but now can be uh, compute anywhere, including the edge. And uh, one of the bigger use cases we see, um, but has even been there since a talk by OpenAI in 2017 at KubeCon, uh, was for training uh, machine learning models. And uh, more importantly, in the case of cloud native computing, is how do you run and host those models and provide an inference endpoint from them, uh, whether they were HTTP or gRPC, which is another CNCF project. Um, so beyond the technology, uh, there's lots of other great aspects, non-functional aspects that go along with containerization. Uh, it makes better use of the hardware or services you have. Uh, it lend lends to architectures that are very uh, resilient and scalable, uh, intolerant to failure. Um, it's something where you can build something on your laptop take that into a server and then put it on the cloud uh, without really changing your code. So it provides a nice model for developers to learn and contribute and build systems. And um, it really enables a lot more rapid software development. So uh, that's really some of the key reasons people are involved in the CNCF community. Um, the CNCF today includes staff like myself. Uh, there's only a couple dozen of us. Uh, we're a completely remote. Um, uh, system of folks, and it still blows my mind that we can run a conference of 13,000 people with such a small staff. When I joined, I was incredibly surprised the CNCF itself is so small. Um, but it's a huge community of contributors, uh, close to 200 projects, and almost 300,000 contributors now. And that's new contributors, like hopefully you'll be today, as well as long-standing folks that have been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, with that group of um, close to 200 open source projects, it is a fantastic place to make your first contribution. So I'm glad you're here. And um, the CNCF itself, there are projects in many different areas, but also different maturity levels, starting from something we call sandbox projects. Uh, these are ones that are relatively new, but maybe have a, a growing community around them, to ones that are incubating, uh, which are a little more mature, have better governance, have more diverse contributors from different companies. And finally, to graduated projects. Uh, and these are the projects that people build products around. So for example, um, Google Cloud Platform offers Kubernetes as a service, as does IBM. You've got Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, these are built on the graduated projects. And they're always evolving as new projects work through this pipeline. Um, and if you're familiar with the book called Crossing the Chasm, uh, it really talks to the end user of the technology. Um, in that book, uh, it discusses who the early adopters are of technology, what their tolerance is for things not being right in the community, um, not being stable, through to the folks that uh, want to wait till something more mature. So for example, I love adopting early stage open source projects. I do not run the latest version of Mac OS on my laptop. I've got no tolerance for a brand new operating system but I have a tolerance for a brand new WASM project, for example. So that gives you kind of the, the target level of the maturity of these projects. And as you're looking at a new project to contribute to, you may want to look at the sandbox projects because those are the smallest communities. They're maybe the easiest ones to get into, and they may have some code that is readily, easily fixable uh, versus something stable like Kubernetes where 
you may have to have a deep uh, learning about the project and the process and um, really have deep technical background. Okay, so let's talk a bit about um, contribution now. So um, my colleague Tyler Dolezal, uh, also on the CNCF staff, uh, he runs a program, which I'll talk about a little bit later, called Zero to Merge. Um, and in that program, he focuses on getting new contributors going within four weeks. And he likes to talk about the different motivations that people have for contributing to open source. Uh, he, he refers to um, a study, I don't recall the author, but they refer to these motivations as extrinsic and intrinsic. So generally, if you're interested in contributing, you probably have something in mind already. You want to build skills, maybe, an extrinsic motivation. You want to uh, build your network to find a new job. Or you have a practical need you're trying to solve. Um, intrinsic means you may just be interested in being a hobbyist, um, maybe just meeting new people, kind of connecting with others. And, and some people can consider coding you know, a fun, relaxing activity to do late at night. And all of those are great motivations to take part in open source. You don't have to be a professional to do it. You can, have, you can participate on the weekends as part of your job, lots of different ways. And projects themselves need stuff, even though we're talking about open source contributions and source code is the focus there. Uh, uh, lots of other ways to contribute that are non-technical. Uh, a few years ago at an open source summit in North America, my colleague uh, Demi Ajayi and I did a talk um, on some of these other ways that you can make a difference. This was in the context of a tech for good program where we wanted to see technical solutions, but we also realized that a lot of passionate people want to do things like use their writing skills, their communication skills, their design skills, and project management skills to improve projects. Every single open source project needs non-technical contributions, and that includes mature ones like Kubernetes. So uh, there's definitely ways to get involved there. Now, um, building on that, some specific examples of your first contributions in those, those areas, uh, you can simply report a bug. If you're trying to install a new open source project in the sandbox on your laptop, and it doesn't support that latest version of Mac OS, you might just report, hey, listen, this is, this is not working on the M2 processor. It doesn't compile. It's got a problem. I don't know how to fix it, but it's a problem. I got a new computer. It's a problem. Um, or if you're inclined, you can actually you know, submit maybe a technical patch for that sort of thing. Find out maybe it's just a simple change to a build target. Um, and finally, you can provide a new feature, um, something that does take advantage of maybe the GPUs on a new machine um, and extend the important performance of a project. Uh, but again, start as simple as reporting a typo, um, translating documentation into German, or whatever your, your language may be, and making sure that you expand the community of users who are in turn able to report other problems or test the software to make it better for everybody. Um, and you can contribute a logo. Actually, one of the programs that's run every year, it's called Hacktoberfest. Have any of you heard of this? It's kind of got a little bit of an iffy reputation here and there because it, it is a very low barrier to contributing, so some contributors, some maintainers don't like how easy it is for people to contribute. But that said, there's a lot of value that comes out of it, and one of the best ones I saw in an open source project I maintained was we got an awesome logo uh, for, for this earthquake detection software we were building. It's a really cool waveform, opened EW. It's awesome. So uh, there's lots of different programs out there, lots of ways you can contribute. And most people who do turn into open source contributors, obviously they start somewhere, right? And hopefully for you, that's today. Uh, we call this the ascending contributor ladder. Um, and so folks normally start out as a user of software. Uh, they become a participant in the community, again, reporting bugs. And um, then they start their journey as a contributor. And ideally, you then become a leader in the community as well. Um, so it's a, it's a whole world of opportunity that goes beyond what maybe you contribute today. And I really, really, if you're, if you're serious about a career in the tech industry, uh, whatever your background, open source contributions are a great interview topic for you. I was talking to a colleague of mine at the booth. Um, one of the students I gave a talk to his class a couple years ago, they were having trouble in an interview, really nervous, really struggling. They talked about how they learned GitHub through a 45 minute session and that turned them into being somebody that they hired on the spot. I was kind of surprised about that, but it, it's your first contribution. Everybody can see it. It's a public record. And so it's a great way to, to expand your career. 
Okay, so the most common way that open source projects are managed is through GitHub. Um, it's the de facto place for uh, social coding, for managing uh, the software itself, but also the release process, the bug reporting, the, um, the, just the fundamental source control platform for any open source projects. Uh, here's two good resources I recommend. They're both free. Uh, one comes from the Linux Foundation. Um, it's this uh, beginner's guide to open source software development. It's um, a, a few hours to maybe a day or a couple weeks, depending on how much time you put into it. But it's a really good introduction. Um, if you want to do something shorter, I put something together in, in my call for code days as a way for someone to, in about half an hour, quickly get up to speed with GitHub. And a key component of this that was kind of threatening to me 10 years ago was how do I submit my first pull request to a project without annoying somebody? Like, I don't want to send a pull request and have someone yell at me that even though my code was great, I didn't follow the rules. So I created an automation where you can practice pull requests. It's just, you fix a typo, you commit it, you send it, my system will check it out. If you did it, you'll get a thumbs up. Otherwise, it'll tell you to go fix it. And it's kind of a non-threatening play to do it, to kind of get good with pull requests, because that's the main contribution mechanism. Uh, so that's my, my beginner's open source uh, workshop there. Okay, once you've gotten the basics of GitHub understood and, and practiced and kind of learned about them, uh, the CNCF and the larger Linux Foundation has five good entry points, uh, depending on how you want to learn the technology, where you want to go. I apologize for all those QR codes, but um, they all have great online resources. Uh, the first one is the main location for CNCF projects. We have a website at contribute.cncf.io. It's focused on best practices for maintainers, new contributors, folks that have been part of the community for, for ages that want to use a new service that we as staff offer, like Oracle Cloud Credits. All that's documented there. It points to our maintainer help desk. Uh, we run a CNCF Slack. It's one of the bigger ones in the world. I know when I worked at IBM with Jim over there, we had the biggest corporate Slack, but I think now in this role we have the second biggest Slack and the open source Slack between Kubernetes and, and Cloud Native Computing Foundation Slack instances. Uh, Clotributor is a great website that aggregates from those 200 open source projects uh, a set of good first issues, things that are looking for help. Uh, you can discover those, kind of search and filter and find and learn about new projects. I mentioned Zero to Merge before. Uh, this is a new program my colleague Taylor's been working on. They do a couple of cohorts a year. You work through for four weeks in a virtual environment. You learn those GitHub skills. Uh, you pick a project and you commit to it. Um, so take a look for the new uh, cohort. I think it's starting up this fall. Um, and also we run a couple of LFX mentorship um, uh, programs per year. And what this is, it connects maintainer with a potential mentee who gets a stipend to go complete something over the course of three or six months. So if you're a student or just, you know, you want to learn something in your spare time, look at the LFX mentorship program. Uh, it's a great way to... To, to dip your toes in. But again, any of these are great ways to, to start. Uh, a really important aspect of joining the open source community is, um, is making sure that you're a good citizen. Uh, everybody loves you know, to give something and contribute something, uh, but you gotta make sure that it's, a f it's gonna be accepted, it's gonna be something that people see the value in. And so uh, a really good, uh, important practice is, is really look at the readme in the GitHub repo, understand what the project is about as the central starting point for a specific project. They may also have a website linked from it, and uh, that will tell you the basics. Uh, it'll also generally tell you how the project is run. Uh, it may have meetings in certain time zones, good for different parts of the world. You may have a contact. You can ping on Slack to ask a question. Um, and they generally have we have a CNCF calendar that shows all of these projects their regular meeting times. Uh, so you can find those through uh, calendar.cncf.io uh, as well as within the README. And uh, really important is uh, many of these projects uh, follow this convention of having a contributing.md file. And that will talk about how to structure your commit. If you're reporting a bug, it may have a template that says, what's your platform? When does this happen? What's the expected outcome? 
And that really is the, the right place to make sure that when you propose a fix, you're doing it the way the maintainer hopes to see it and that they're more likely to accept your change. Um, even as small as, you know, the size of your commits, how many things you should contribute at once, uh, things like that. And, and as a project grows, they get a little bit more nervous about taking, you know, something that's not well documented as a commit. Okay. Great. So building on that idea, um, it's helpful to see how maintainers are attempting to grow their communities of new contributors. And I highly recommend this session. It was, um, it was done at KubeCon in Paris a couple months ago uh, some, with some really, really helpful, uh, thoughtful folks from the Cloud, uh, from the cloud Data Computing um, Tag Contributor, which is a, a group focused on contributor um, strategy. They're the ones that really maintain contribute.cncf.io. They talk about, from a maintainer point of view, two other maintainers, these are techniques on how to grow your community. You know, be welcoming. Uh, be, you know, be clear about how you recognize contributors. And so it really helps you see an open source project and the people behind that project, the challenges they have, and some of the, the things there, it shows you that they're not people to be you know, afraid of, that they're these uh, intimidating folks that are technological experts. Uh, all projects are made of people. So it helps you understand what maintainers are passionate about, how they want to help you, and how you can contribute. So again, it's focused on maintainers, but it's really a nice look behind the mirror uh, to see what projects are doing. Okay, so now that you know how to make your first contribution, some good starting points there, the CNCF itself has a whole bunch of other resources that you can take advantage of uh, that'll help you build your skills. And maybe you'll make your second commit. Maybe you'll explore a new project. Maybe you'll um, pick up a new certification or, or, or do something like that. And the, the greatest kind of learning resource we have um, includes free resources. There's some paid resources, too. I can, I can talk about a discount code as well. Um, but training and certification uh, includes that Linux Foundation Introduction to Open Source course. Uh, it includes um, a really popular Kubernetes course that's free as well, really used by a lot of folks. Kubernetes being just one of the CNCF projects, but being one of the most mature ones out there. Um, and it includes details on some certification exams that help you go from, um, I'm new to cloud computing, um, I know the basics, I've got a badge for that, through to, I'm an advanced security engineer familiar with installing and, and hardening Kubernetes. Uh, the mentorship program I talked about uh, it's great if you're interested in finding opportunities, but as you grow, uh, your company or you as an individual may want to fund a mentorship to find new contributors or you know, recruit new talent in the industry. Uh, so a really good mentorship program uh, with hundreds of folks every, every year, lots of different organizations. And um, I mentioned the ambassador program earlier. Um, as you build your skills, one of the key things when you're growing at a company like Jim and I were at at IBM was, you know, you can show your skills, but you've got to expand your impact as well. And you do that by generating IP, like blog posts, uh, creating code, of course, contributing to conferences, being a speaker, being recognized for those skills. Um, so as you do that, you can in turn be recognized for how you help the community by becoming a cloud computing ambassador. Uh, they do a couple of uh, cohorts, oh, you get selected in once a year, but they do, they accept applications a couple times a year. And it's really a great way to be recognized for the volunteer time you've put into an open source project, uh, which in turn helps you, you know, join maybe another open source project. Um, there is a new cool program that was announced in Paris as well. Um, it's called a Cubestronaut. Has anybody heard what this is? Okay. So, in the CNCF, there's five certification badges or tests I had mentioned. There's two entry-level ones. Um, there's the, they're called the associate ones. They're on the right side of the screen. Kubernetes and Cloud Native Associate. Uh, it's a 60-question multiple-choice test. You take over two hours. That gets you one badge. You learn the basics. You learn the terminology. You learn some basic Git as well. There's Cloud Native Security, uh, which is also an intro to the topic. Very important. Um, but it's from an entry-level point of view. 
And then there's three more complex ones. Uh, one about being a Kubernetes administrator, one about writing Kubernetes applications, cloud native applications, and one about really um, hardening a system, which is the most complex one. As folks take these exams, if you do all five of them, you get a nice fancy jacket. Um, I got to haul these all the way from the US earlier and I broke my suitcase because there were so many folks who, uh, who got jackets and I had to give them out here. Um, Stefan is one of them. I thought he might be here, but I don't think so. He's, uh, he's a, one of our newly minted um, Cubestronauts as well. So if you build your skills, you get recognized for them. Um, it's a nice, uh, really cool uh, cohort to be part of. Those certifications though, they, they cost like 100 bucks, 200 bucks a piece. So one of the things we try to do for our, our developers is make sure that you know, the cost can be at least chipped away if you're, you're, you really wanna go ahead and pursue those. Um, so it's this one here, CNCF, OSEU 24. Um, you can learn more about that downstairs as well. There's a bunch of other Linux Foundation certifications to explore. Um, so go take a look at that. Hopefully you can get started, at least with the KCNA one. It's a pretty, pretty easy one to, to get started with and work from, and it'll give you a feel for how these tests are run. Okay, and the CNCF, kind of the key pillars of what we do, the main one is obviously the open source projects. Uh, a second one is getting companies to be members and support the work we do. Um, the third was the training and certifications I just mentioned. Uh, finally, we do a lot of events. And so we do a large KubeCon slash Cloud Native com, Con in one region once a year. So we do a KubeCon North America, which this year is gonna be in Salt Lake City in two months. Uh, there was one in Paris I mentioned. There's gonna be one in London next year. Uh, there's gonna be an, one for the first time in India in December. And uh, beyond those large 10,000 people events, we also do regional events. Uh, we're gonna have one in Colombia and South America next month, as well as Australia. So if you're in those regions, it might be interesting to, uh, to take part in those one day events. And then there are tons of meetups or cloud community, uh, Kubernetes KCDs, Kubernetes Community Days, which happen around the world. Uh, these are generally very low cost, if maybe free events, um, and they spring up all the time. Um, so they've had one, I think, in Vienna uh, earlier this year. Uh, whatever city you are, whether you're in Europe, Asia, the Americas, you'll, you'll probably find a KCD near you, if not a um, cloud native community group, uh, a meetup. So these are really good places to you know, talk to other folks, learn about contributing opportunities, and of course, uh, job opportunities. Okay, um, one final aside here. Um, if your company or if you already have an open source project, you've got a little more advanced skills, maybe you have like 100 stars on your, your GitHub project, somebody's using it, you've got a community starting to grow, and you want the support of the CNCF for that project, whether it's technical skills or, or visibility or marketing for it, um, one of the things you as a con company or contributor um, can do, you know, if, for example, you're, if you're at a company that's created something internally that you think other folks are gonna get some, some use out of that you wanna set a standard around or build community one, uh, you can bring it to the CNCF through our sandbox project. Uh, as I mentioned, that's the first part of the funnel. Um, you can donate it there um, and um, you know, apply It'll be assessed by the technical oversight committee um, who will decide whether you know, it's something they want to bring into the CNCF that's going to be valuable to the community. Okay, so with that, I want to welcome you to the foundation as new contributors. I uh, hope to see um, some contributions. If you do make your first one, I'd love to know about it. Again, um, you know, find me on LinkedIn and uh, tell me that happened. You know, I, I still use X a little bit, but not as much as LinkedIn these days. Um, so if you do want to connect, kind of, I'd love to hear about your journey. Um, if you have any other, you know, questions or you want to be, you know, you're saying, I, you know, I, am really good at JavaScript. How do I contribute to a server side project with that? I was a front end developer. Uh, we really want to connect these projects we host with new contributors and make sure that it's as easy as possible uh, for you to make that first quality contribution. Um, so with that, I'll open it up for for Q and A, uh, we have about five ten minutes left here. Um, anybody have questions right now? 
Okay, we have one over here. Okay, so I'll repeat the question for the recording. So the question was, do we have um, essentially a view into the more popular high velocity projects, uh, the ones that are good examples of quality things contribute to? Yes, and in fact, one of the things you can go to first is called the CNCF landscape, landscape.cncf.io. I'm just gonna warn you, it can get a little overwhelming because it's huge, and it's, it's a massive thing, but the goal is for you to see the highest velocity projects in the open source community and maybe see them aside like even a proprietary project or something with a large user base. And to be included on the landscape, they have to have a certain number of GitHub stars or users or some market cap. Within the landscape, you'll see projects that have gotten funding, uh, how long they've been around, when they entered the sandbox, if they moved to the incubation, when that happened, uh, when they got to graduated. So that's a good starting point. There's also in the past, we used to do something called the radar. I think it's coming back. Um, they're going to try to relaunch it. But that also highlights um, some new up and coming projects. And um, in general, if you go to um, cncf.io slash projects, you can see the whole list of projects, links to all of them, and kind of learn there. But I would start with the landscape. So landscape.cncf.io, or just Google CNCF landscape. Yeah. Stars to, to get on there, but initially, how does that kind of process work? Okay, so the question was, how does a project progress through from the sandbox to incubation to graduate? Correct, and there's something, actually, uh, we had a Projects Moving Levels Task Force that just started to optimize this process recently. Um, but essentially, if you go to that sandbox link, this will give you a view into what's needed at a maturity level to join, to be, I'd have a good chance to be accepted in as a sandbox. So there's an application form. It talks about how popular your project is. You, you fill it out. Is it related to any other projects? Is it commonly used with other projects? And so this gives you the baseline of the maturity of what's expected at sandbox. And then after perhaps a year or two, maybe five years, it, it, there's no prescribed time, a project will then decide we're ready for incubation Here's the criteria. We need to have a diverse set of companies that support us, a number of contributors. And as you progress, you actually unlock more visibility as well with the CNCF in terms of you get sessions at KubeCon to talk about your project. You might have a whole day to talk about your project and invite folks to. And so there's a motivation for projects to, to be more popular, to build a bigger contributor base, to attract new folks like you so that they themselves get more visibility and progress through. Um, so there's a couple of templates. Um, there's one for the sandbox. If you go to, um, if you looked at incubating, incubation application, there's a form uh, that says, you know, can you explain these people? Who are your end users? Is it built as part of a product already? And, it, and you fill that out, you answer it, you do a couple of presentations to the internal technical leaders within the CNCF um, open source community, and they will then decide, you, you need to fill in these gaps before we accept you or to the next level, or yes, you are ready. Um, so you'll see those. Those are uh, incubation application and graduating applications. And they're all visible too. Um, if you go to the github.com uh, slash cncf slash toc, there's a project board that shows you our backlog of about 11 projects that want to go to incubation, um, four that want to go to graduation, where they are, and you know, are they ready for a vote right now? Um, so there's there's a well-documented process. We're always trying to improve it. Um, but that's essentially what it is. G gates that you know, show your, your contributor diversity, your health. And the Linux Foundation itself has a bunch of uh, tools, one of which is called DevStats. Another new one is called Insights. And they provide a bunch of stats around an open source project that really gives you a feel for how mature it is. So maybe you as an end user, which is another big community, and our end user technical advisory board, to understand, can I build a product on top of this? Is it mature enough? 
and that gives you a project health dashboard. Uh, so you can see the history and the maturity out in the open of this project. Okay, another question over here? Uh, that's a good question. So the question was about the radar. So the radar was an initiative to kind of understand some up and coming projects. Um, it was it was ideally there to raise some awareness around them, but it doesn't really exist right now. Um, but the best way to see velocity is has it been added to the landscape? Um, uh, have you seen potentially some news media talk about it? And that's why it's really great. These um, in particular, even if you don't attend these events around the world, um, when they happen, there's gonna be a lot of interesting news articles generated around, for example, the keynote, talked about a new project, uh, like there was one that came out of Paris called SPIN. Um, it's not in the CNCF yet, but it's one related to WASM. So it be, you know, a sponsor talked about it, so that's one way that you learn about it. Um, others, if there's a news article, hey listen, we heard about this great tech session, this one we're gonna highlight, it's something really cool that was just announced. Um, and a lot of innovations in the tech industry start as, you know, an obscure tech talk that was at an event that nobody saw until they saw the recording later on. Um, so those are, whenever these events happen, it's a really good way to get your, your finger on the pulse of something new. Yeah, I have one more question. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, good question. So it's around uh, rug pulling, right? So this is actually something that's happened in the industry, um, really where an open source project is laid out for the community to contribute to, and then a vendor maybe behind it changes the license on it um, to make it less open source. Um, so I won't talk specifically around any particular project, um, but the, the maturity process we talked about, um, when a project is accepted into the sandbox, it needs to have shown that it has a certain level of governance and a license. And once it's accepted, it then goes through an onboarding checklist. And this includes things like, okay, you do have a developer certificate of origin or a CLA, a contribution agreement, uh, that you've got the right licensing in process, um, that, sh that the Linux Foundation is the neutral home for your code. Uh, we host, for example, that in our GitHub Enterprise instance. Uh, the Linux Foundation GitHub user ID has the spare keys to the house, as it were, so that this project is in the neutral home and no one can just take the ball and go. So there's a bunch of uh, onboarding steps that a project goes through, and the goal is this, this ensures a neutral home, um, and that's really for the open source community to, to, to really have a trust that this project is going gonna, is gonna to move on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other... Questions? All right. Well, thanks again. Um, yeah, again, I'll, I'll be around next couple of days if you want to find me or connect with me in the booth. Um, hope you have a great rest of your conference, and hopefully you've got what you need to make your first contribution. <laughs>